my actions all that I possess. And if need be I will carry your death wish, hum hum, back into the arms of this real life. My back to your back. This has been no easy religion, hmm. Written, break, lift and thrived. Why would anyone want to do this anyway? A fair number of the benefits of this system have already been alluded to in the preceding sections. However, not all have, and it is worthwhile to give them the coherency of their own section for the reader to reference. Moreover, whereas the preceding sections either lay out the theory or address the concerns folks are likely to have with it, this section is designed rather specifically to extol the plausible virtues of a moneyless free labor society. Beyond the concern, pragmatics, and nitty-gritty inner workings of the systemization of societies, there are the fairly important broad strokes that a given systemization sets forth. Typically these kinds of things are the real motivating features of a systemization of society, the aspects that folks want to endure, the aspects that give them reason to want such a thing. The whys of the why bothers with anything at all. It ought to be obvious, but absent money wherein access to all the goods and services available within a bioregion are free, the incentive to steal, scam, bamboozle, con people, etc., are all minimized and perhaps eliminated. There is of course the possibility that some folks would steal anyway, or try scamming someone, or some other such thing, but TBH overall it's actually kind of difficult to understand why anyone would do so as a matter of pragmatics. Such may possibly happen due to mental illness, meanness, or some other such factor, but not for concerns of needs, wants, or desires. There is a distinction between publicly available goods and services and privately available goods and services. In pragmatics this primarily has to do with in-home v out-of-home, and what goods and services are freely available within any given public space. After all, for instance, the furnishings of a restaurant are not freely available for anyone to take. I honestly consider this point to be fairly obvious. But it can be generalized as whatever goods or services someone is choosing to provide are exactly the goods and services that are freely available. My sense is that an asinine person could fairly easily steal something. That is, take something that was not intended to be provided or to steal that which was freely given but that such actions are rare, rather odd, and ultimately not of significant concern, though they ought be avoided. For instance, folks may attempt to steal something that wasn't ever offered up, such as private goods of the home, etc. Why they would do so, however, would be fairly extremely idiosyncratic, as they would have access to similar material goods elsewhere. We are speaking of things that have value via their sentimentality, familial relation, relative uniqueness, etc. Likewise, someone may end up stealing something that was freely given, but with some kinds of limitations associated with it, as in, to utilize something in a way by which it wasn't intended or allowed to be utilized. Or, whereby what was offered was partial access, and instead it is taken as exclusive access. Again, I think such instances would be fairly odd, rare, and idiosyncratic to peculiar circumstances, as aside from relatively unique things, things that have sentimental value, familial value, etc., those kinds of goods and services are available freely elsewhere. In other words, there just isn't a strong motivational force to do so. Now, childishness may be among the strongest such motivational forces for such behaviors. A kind of playfulness, hooliganism, etc., 
whereby breaking the law is done for the funsies of it all. And TBH I have some significant degree of sympathy towards such behaviors from the wee ones that is. It is something that is actually quite fun, enjoyable, and worthwhile I'd say in terms of lived experiences, life, something to do, etc. I am here speaking of such amaze ball things as stealing food from someone's garden, petty vandalism, trespassing, and so forth. Things that really are quite petty, mostly or completely harmless, and ultimately are fun kinds of things for the little ones to do. If the adults here can manage to recall themselves being the wee ones, and perhaps have the good sense to understand that of course the adults knew what you were doing, we just thought it was cute. Musing a boundary, just to watch you gingerly step over it. Now, this understanding of criminal behavior is actually predicated upon not only the moneyless free labor society, but also the ethics argued for and defined within the odd questions of privilege, a slight history of colonialism. Or as will the poets, the gleam in your eyes, sent little tingles down my spine. But then you smiled and looked at me and I was frozen in time. To the former, this piece, the fact that within the system the actual availability of all non-private goods and services is free, entails that it is technically impossible to steal the goods on offer at public places. Again, one could steal the goods or services from a public place that was not on the offer. But if the goods or services are on the offer in public spaces, they cannot really be stolen. Perhaps one could take them inappropriately, as in, not follow the procedure of acquiring them, but then, such is not really stealing so much as being a bit of a hooligan. Moreover, it isn't as if, in general, such goods that may be stolen from public places, the things that were not on the offer cause much harm to the person being stolen from. After all, those things too were freely given to the public establishment. Granting that such is shitty behavior on the part of the persons doing the stealing, the point is that the harms associated with it are at least lessened, perhaps minimized, and possibly eliminated. The delineation between public and private having been fairly warped to moneyed concerns in the current, it is worthwhile giving just a scant bit of attention to that particular distinction. Businesses are public places. The barber shop is a public space, not a private one. A restaurant is a public space, not a private one. Businesses by their very nature are public places, not private places. Private places are homes and houses, places where people live, where entrance to such a place is by asking and inviting. The notion that businesses are anything other than public places is to pretty much completely misconstrue the meanings of those terms. Being privileged or honored enough to be the local barber, storekeep, shopkeep, restaurateur, etc., entails the capacity to make choices about the place, but the place is a public space, not a private one of ownership. Ownership is an odd turn of phrase, something a slave master might be familiar with, but no free person should consider without some seriously shaded eyes. Likewise, the stealing from private places is at least mostly harmless. No one is going to starve or be seriously harmed by doing so beyond the sentimentalities and idiosyncrasies of the theft, damage to the property, etc. That said, it is exactly the idiosyncratic, the sentimental, the personal things that carry the worth of the meaningful distinctions between public and private things. Stealing something of value really entails stealing something of personal sentimental worth, or stealing something that has an idiosyncratic relationship to someone's.
Folks ought be able to get a sense of what is meant here by private, public, in-home, and out-of-home concerns, publicly available and goods and services that are not intended for public use. Having the capacity to have private goods and services, private relationships, idiosyncratic relationships with things and people are all kinds of important things for the species. Though I would note here that such concerns are strikingly similar to the concerns regarding the supposed value of monies, there isn't anything obvious of intrinsic value therein. Such diverges a bit too far from this piece's topics, but there is a tangential relation to this section. One cannot steal something that has no value. Value, in other words, is what takes on the meaningful import of stealing or not. Not ownership as such. It is the violation of the relevant kind of idiosyncratic relationships people have with their goods, services, with other people, that constitutes the meaningful harm associated with stealing. Not, again, ownership as such. In some non-trivial sense this point constitutes much the ado about nothing at all in the current societies via moneyed concerns. Speaking of tenderness. Some girls, they don't forget it. Love is their only happiness. But it's all so easy, all you gotta do is. Try a little tenderness. That's all you gotta do. Folks are mistaking the supposed value of money for actual value and thereby associating what may actually be a harm, the stealing of someone's personal things, the disruption of someone's idiosyncratic relationships, with that which is not actually harmful, the loss of wealth, moneyed concerns, etc. Granting that there is something to the notion of stealing as being potentially harmful to people predicated upon its capacity to remove the necessary goods and services for their survival or their various needs, wants and desires, such is hardly the actual harm that accrues most oft in the case of stealing and thievery. Rare, that is, is it the case that theft actually entails anything like a significant harm to the meeting of the needs, wants and desires of people, even in the current wherein such is at least technically possible? Rather, the harms largely accrue through these violations of the idiosyncratic relationships between peoples, and between peoples and objects, land, things, etc., Again, not concerns of ownership, but rather, concerns of relationships. In a related and somewhat broader sense, it is said that 90% of the law is about ownership. Moneyed concerns for the most part, though not completely, hence, we ought expect about 90% of the laws to vanish within a moneyless free labor society. Such ought, of course, be viewed as a significant boon to people. The elimination of vast swaths of bureaucratic BS, legal wrangling, superfluous jobs, and the various horrors associated with the enforcement of those laws. To the latter, the important delineation between the kinds of ethical concerns therein, that of aesthetic ethical concerns and obligatory ethical concerns, has a fairly straightforward analog to the legality of things, namely, the aesthetic ethical concerns are not properly applicable as legal concerns, whereas the obligatory ethical concerns are. This eliminates a significant swath of legal mumbo-jumbo from the books, laws that deal with aesthetical concerns. By doing so, much of the issues thereof are resolved out of hand. On this point, see also the piece, The Rape of the Swan, which attempts to handle the various socio-cultural hoopla around gendered and sexual norms of behavior. The point being that there is a lot of criminalization of human behavior predicated upon these sorts of things that are also, uh, super iffy to put it politely. Finally, on this point, 
there is a broad theory that likely has some significant amount of virtues to it that much, perhaps all, of criminal behavior is predicated upon prior shitty conditions. In other words, things such as poverty breed criminal behavior beyond merely stealing. If folks are no longer living in poverty, we might expect that there would be a significant drop in crime in general, beyond that of mere theft, but certainly inclusive to theft. While such is not exactly a proven sort of thing, it is a pretty strongly supported theory via the available evidence, and hence the prospects for the mass reduction of criminal behavior in general is plausible. Without going into too much detail here on it, I'd invite the gentler readers to really consider the degree whereby social strife may be arising from moneyed concerns. For instance, strife between lovers whereby domestic violence may arise, how much of that may stem from moneyed concerns, how much of that may simply go away absent moneyed concerns. Undoubtedly some may still remain, Domestic violence and strife between lovers rather infamously isn't reducible to moneyed concerns, but some non-trivial amount of it is. Likewise, how much of other kinds of social strife stems from, in essence, fighting over money? How much, say, do hate crimes have as their root cause people placing blame on others for problems that are really about moneyed concerns? those dang Jews. How many friendships destroyed or denied from happening at all via moneyed concerns? As in, someone simply doesn't have the time to participate in friendships because they've got to focus on the monies, or as with other lovers, the stresses and hardships of moneyed concerns put strains upon their friendships? In each of these cases, we are likewise speaking to the crimes that thereby accrue. It's speculative, but highly suggestive. Didn't mind the distance, didn't mind the distance, I don't mind. Wish your job was different, I can only wait for. Used to be chill. Feelings got deep real fast, real, real. Deeper, heavy, fast, I feel. It's a little deeper, I feel, I feel. Heavy, fast, I. Won't lose grip. Chest to mouth, sex to mouth. I'm feeling it. Deeper than before. Hate sleeping alone. The reduction of overall labor fundamentally has several aspects to it, some strongly related to the hands of labor some that just kind of fall out of the system. In the case of the theory, we are understanding the reduction of overall work hours as an essential good. Pretty much anywhere we can go without laboring, especially outside the home, while retaining high-quality lives, we call such a good. Understanding that much of the quality of lives resides within the capacity to have and raise a family, have access to high-quality goods and services, capacity to do hobbies, be playful, travel, etc. 1. Absent the use of money, whole sectors of the existing economy largely or completely go away, or at the least they are wildly transformed. Here of course I am pointing especially to the finance sector of the economy those that literally deal with money as a matter of business. It is actually a bit difficult to tell from the perspective of the theory exactly which of these jobs and businesses would really go away, which may transform to a wildly different form, and which may remain but in a very diminished form. After all, accounting as a skill remains relevant. Counting goods, keeping track of which goods go where, keeping track of hours worked, and in general tallying totals and so forth all remain relevant skills. Whereas, say, stock markets seem like they are entirely irrelevant, though who knows, 
perhaps someone will find a use for the skills associated with the laborers in the stock market within the system, or perhaps some relevant transformed version of the stock market, such that it is not predicated upon money but perhaps as a useful measurement of value of various industries via some other metric. See, for instance, the various discussions regarding the open gift-giving market as a plausible analog to the stock market. Banks likely don't have much of a meaningful role as such, though again, perhaps there are skills associated with it that may have relevance in other ways. Again, such is actually fairly difficult to tell from the theory alone as others and in practice there may be aspects that remain relevant. In any case, all such reductions in labor are an essential good. It gifts back to the laborers their time which they can thereby utilize towards other essential labors, like raising families, enjoying life, socializing, doing hobbies, which generally produce other kinds of goods and services, and so forth. Two. The mass reduction in trade through the reliance on bioregional constraints likewise entails a massive reduction in work hours associated with trading. These labors remain relevant, but likely significantly diminished. 3. The removal of superfluous labor through the hands of labor. The laborer is incentivized to produce high-quality goods that last longer as this means less labor for them, maintain existing goods as long as possible, efficiently utilize local and non-local resources as such entails less labor overall. Their reward is the reduction in work hours, which in turn are largely spent doing the labors within the home, raising families, and partaking in the goods and services freely available to them. At the same time, the laborer is incentivized to work as such is exactly what provides them with the freely available goods and services within the local community. Absent the metrics of money on high fiats and arbitrary standards, the hands of labor balance these out to a maximal degree relative to a given bioregion predicated upon the needs, wants and desires of the people within said bioregion. Overall, we ought expect the system to reduce the labor requirements, weeding out superfluous jobs and products, etc. As a thing worth noting, it is possible to also by simple agreement within the system to adjust labor at any given time. People just agree that more or less labor is needed at some given point. This is possible in part because of the availability of time that the laborers have if more labor is needed. A call can go out, people will have the time available to go do that particular labor. See discussion regarding the open gift-giving market. Or, if there is too much of some kind of product, overproduction, or too much of something is being extracted, labor requirements can simply be reduced without concern for the well-being of laborers involved. They retain full access to the goods and services. See discussion of the lazy fisher folks. More to the point, such over- or under-production of a service or product is largely controlled without necessarily any appeal to some fiat. Such fiats may be necessary from time to time, as in emergency situations, but in general labor has exactly zero incentive to overproduce any product, and has incentive enough to work to provide for their local communities as, after all, those goods and services are exactly what the laborer gets for doing their labor. 4. Strongly related to 1 and 3, the system provides very little to no incentive for scam labor. That is, those jobs within the current system designed to harm people, steal from them, provide low-quality products, etc., all largely or completely go away. We lament over those kinds of jobs in the first place, and we may not be particularly fond of the people doing them, 
but such is not really the point. The point is that within a moneyless free labor system, there is simply no incentive to do those kinds of things in the first place. On the point of providing low-quality products, there are two key aspects. For a. The propensity for labor to prefer to provide higher quality, more durable goods entails some significant degree of removal of low-quality goods, whatsoever those goods may be. For b. Removal of superfluous goods and services. Here we are largely pointing to the plethora of goods that create a glut of products. What is provided here is not an exhaustive list, but merely some plausible goods and services that would no longer be produced or provided. For bi goods, for instance, that are utilized purely as a way of advertising or enticing people to buy some other product, as in, get this thing free when you buy this other thing, since there is no need to buy anything, offering some other freebie is pointless. For BII goods imitating other goods. Here we refer to so-called cheap knockoffs. Their value in the current system, of course, is to provide some cheaper version of some other product on the market. However, such incentives to do so largely go away. Little doubt there will be plenty of lesser or higher quality goods around, but in terms of deliberately making, knock off low quality goods, there is no real incentive to do so. Perhaps among the most relevant of cases regards construction materials and materials used within machinery. As a matter of pragmatics, a large number of these kinds of goods largely go away in virtue of the reduction of trade, as a large portion of these kinds of goods and services are strongly related to the desire to make money through trading them with other bioregions. It is somewhat unclear as to the degree that this system will accomplish this particular task, after all. The expected increase in hobbies, small craft industries, etc., all will likely entail a great degree of imitation. However, when it comes to industrial goods, that is, goods that are derived from large-scale industries, the moneyless free labor system ought to remove the incentives to do so. After all, they aren't trying to make a buck by doing things cheaply, nor are they trying to make a buck by scamming. They would be trying to make the goods and services largely for their own community, and largely providing the very goods and services they themselves will be utilizing within said community. Making something cheaply simply means they have to make it again. In other words, there are incentives to copy, to imitate, but there are not incentives to make cheap, low-quality knockoffs. For BIII reduction via bioregional constraints. Some goods and services that are only available via interbioregional trade would tend to go away, as there isn't any particular incentive to provide for them. The degree of this varies a great deal and is discussed with greater detail elsewhere in this piece. But in general the imperative for shorter supply lines and the reality of bioregional constraints, coupled with the hands of labor, will tend to not produce a good amount of the goods and services it currently does for far-flung bioregions. Which isn't to suggest that those goods and services aren't necessarily produced at all, but rather, that such goods and services would be produced more locally and without an eye to making a buck. Being more locally produced itself entails less work hours overall in the system, while lacking the motivation of moneyed concerns entails fewer of the products being produced, or more pointedly, a better balance whereby overproduction is avoided. 5. Better utilization of technologies towards the aims of reduction in overall work hours. This aspect, like the others, is not something whereby folks can determine the amount of reduction via the theory alone. 
In this case, the point is best summed up by the reality that in the current the loss of a job is necessarily considered a bad. This is true from the overall economy's perspective, as well as the perspective of labor with the capital L. There are, however, other kinds of aspects to this concern that are perhaps more apparent these days, such as the plausible capacity to utilize the internets for commuting to work, the reduction thereby in office spaces, the reduction thereby in middle management positions, and so on. In each of these kinds of cases, there is significant push back from people because, after all, those kinds of reductions entail a reduction in the amount of money they are making, and I mean, to their imaginative fictive musings, money is life. So like, it matters a lot to them. Course, such is actually quite crazed, perhaps a literal sort of madness people are suffering from, but nonetheless it is there. Such labor in a moneyless society is simply noted as not being worthwhile for a wide variety of reasons, and is thereby negated with that time being gifted back to the laborers. 6. Maximally Superfluous Labor It is unclear how much labor currently is merely a product of the systemization's requirement to work to live. There is no small amount of it, however. I want to try and be as clear as I can on this point, a lot of labor, perhaps a great deal of labor, is in the system simply because people are forced to work to live. I want to try and give some examples, both generalized and specific. 6a. Most jobs associated with pushy sales tactics. While adverts are relevant, any job whereby the aim is to try and force someone to buy something simply in virtue of making money, such jobs are maximally superfluous labor. They quite literally only exist within a moneyed society. Understanding that here we are not merely talking about those jobs no longer having a pushy sales tactic to them, but rather... We are speaking of jobs that either exist specifically as pushy sales tactics, a lot of advertising jobs for instance, or jobs that exist as a result of pushy sales tactics, as in, no one actually needs, wants or desires either those jobs or the services they provide, they merely exist due to the force of effort of pushy sales tactics. 6b Jobs Done Out of Desperation these include the immediately preceding section's point about the reduction of thievery and criminal activity in general. Often enough those are exactly the sorts of jobs that are done out of desperation. But it also includes a fair number of jobs that are done which are not criminal in nature, but which wouldn't exist save for the depraved taking advantage of the desperate. Jobs that are, let's say, not of the kind anyone would want to do, and slash or which no one really needs, wants or desires the products or services thereof, but which exist because folks are desperate for money in order to live, and some persons takes advantage of that fact to force them to do some job. 6bi kinds of labor no one wants to do. We may refer to Oh, the butler, the maid, the personal chef, the personal staff at a mansion, etc. None of these jobs are really producing anything significant for society by almost any stretch of the imagination. See section 12a and 12b on the role of luxury goods and services. We might also include therein a significant amount of domestic labor. That is done outside the home of the person doing the labor. Though again, not exactly all said labor, for example, there are undoubtedly instances whereby in home care of elders is appropriate to be done by a pro or someone not in the family. Nonetheless, that kind of labor likely largely goes away, as absent the need to work to live, most folks are going to be content, say, cleaning and raising their own kids rather than someone else's kids. 
Moreover, the more time they've available at home, the more likely they take care of their own elders, their own familial needs, wants and desires, and hence a less demand in outside of the home labor of that kind. All of these kinds of labors are labors folks may and do appreciate the products and services thereof, but which with a few exceptions, the laborers themselves have no desire whatsoever to do, and indeed, would do far better without, and moreover, the whole of society would do far better without. That is, Society would functionally operate better if folks had the time and capacity to do those kinds of labors for their own families. There is a bit of relevant nuance to this, as some kinds of out-of-home domestic labor is actually a good for everyone. And it is entirely plausibly the case that some out-of-home domestic labor is of the kind the workers themselves may desire, such as the actual staff of royalty may actually prefer to do that job for a number of reasons. Hotel staff and bed and breakfast places may choose to do so for a wide variety of reasons, etc. This point is expanded upon a bit more elsewhere in this piece. Here we merely note that much of such labor would go away in a moneyless free labor society, or perhaps more to the point. Much of such labor would be decentralized to the familial forms rather than done as out-of-home kinds of labor. 6BII Of jobs that folks do by which no one actually even really appreciates the products or services beyond, again, the various scams, low-quality productions, etc., we may refer to such things as mining operations for the generation of wealth, no one, literally no one actually thinks such is a good product. Some folks may think that it is, but in point of fact they themselves are merely misinformed, and when properly informed, they too think that indeed no one actually wants those products. Likewise, there are a host of products that are produced not exactly as a matter of scamming, nor poor quality, but rather, are gimmicky, pointless sorts of things, gadgets, and so forth, that no one really needs, wants, or desires, but which are produced merely out of desperation on the part of the laborers thereof, predicated upon more oft than not, the depraved and perverse greed motives of someone else taking advantage of the desperate to make money for themselves. Folks these days ought just think of the products generally sold on infomercials or YouTube ads. 7. Outright Exploitative Labor Here I have in mind a variety of uncontroversially exploitative kinds of labor. For instance sex work whereby everyone involved is basically exploiting each other, or labor that exists merely because of the status of people, as in, immigrant status, or social status, etc. In these cases, it isn't necessarily that that labor wouldn't exist at all, but that the terms whereby that labor exists would be so different that it likely would significantly diminish, or at any rate, no longer be so exploitative in its form. How many sex workers, after all, would there be if no one had to earn money? And if they're doing it for the sheer pleasure of it, would we not find that far and away less ethically bad at the least? Sex work for love, amateur sex workers. Of life's poetical musings. I just love you. No, I don't mind you crying. And I think of all the times when you were there for me. And you cared for me. There are interesting questions therein as to if such labor could be considered legit labor, in a system that requires folks to work such and such a number of hours a week for such and such a number of years, however, I don't think I will provide that argument here. However, see, the rape of the swan, for a better framing and disposition on the points regarding the ethicity of sex work sans moneyed concerns. Similarly, much of the labor that is done by immigrants 
or other lower social status peoples is valuable labor, both in the sense that it is labor that produces the needs, wants, and desires of a society, and in that it is often enough the kinds of labor that folks might even enjoy doing, or at any rate, wouldn't see as bad kinds of labor. Here the point, though, is that in no small part due to the exploitable nature of the laborers therein, there are not significant incentives to improve the working conditions so that less work hours overall are required to do the work. Likewise, the incentives to work to live entails that the workers themselves are disincentivized to advocate for such things themselves. 8. Though it dovetails with the immediately preceding section, and with 6, all labor associated with the imperative to make money, greed-based jobs, one would assume go away out of hypothesis. Much of these amount to scammy kinds of labor, MLMS, outright thievery, con artistry for money, etc., though I can imagine a con artist doing their thing for other reasons. There is, however, a bit more subtle point therein, namely, absent the greed motivation. There is simply a lacking in the desire to overproduce in general. It is unclear to what degree the current labor market is actually driven by greed, but again, it may be a lot. To be clear, not just greed-based jobs and labor associated with scams, etc., but the imperative to produce and service as many people as possible in order to make more money is the kind of labor we might expect to go away. 9. The general hands of labor largely described throughout this piece. We are referring to the tendency whereby 9a labor prefers to not labor at things that are inefficient in terms of labor. 9b. As labor is removed from the systems, via for instance 1 to 8 here, laborers are gifted back their labor. 9c. Laborers with more time will tend to do labors in home, via hobbies, entrepreneurship, production of entertainment, etc. 9d. Such labors tend to thereby reduce demand on out-of-home labor, as in, Hobbies and small businesses reduce the demand on industries, the general preferred method of labor. 9DI whereby such labor is understood as joyful sorts of labors, the kinds of labors that the species tends to enjoy, is done literally for the joy of it, etc. 9E. Therefore there is a reduction in the overall system of labors and perhaps we may phrase such as the reduction of the laborious labors. 10. Reduction or Elimination of Performative Labors Here we are referring rather specifically to the kinds of labors at a job that are done in order to look busy or to be productive, brown-nosing sorts of things. A bit more than this, though, the kinds of labor at a job that are done pretty much because the worker is there, and something ought to be done while they are there, or simply having workers there because to have them there is to pay them, and paying them is sort of the point of the job. These are the kinds of things that arise both from strict work hour quotas and from the imperatives to work to live. In the former, there is an imperative to work a certain set number of hours in order to qualify for various benefits. Hence, a job that may actually take less time nonetheless has workers on the job for the full allotment of time. Which, to be clear, makes sense in that system, but which entails actual performative labor, just standing around, looking busy, and so forth. In the latter, there are incentives for workers to work more and more hours to make all the more monies. This has of it both the reality of subpar, scammy kinds of labor, pretending to work, taking one's time, and so forth, and also the reality of actively seeking out as much work as possible, even if that work is legitimate labor. Doing so puts pressure on business and society to find jobs, 
any sort of jobs to provide them with labor. This dovetails with several other aspects of this subsection. Here the point is that a moneyless free labor society has a tendency to actively avoid and suss out that kind of labor. Taken in total the strong suggestion here is that these and plausibly other aspects of a moneyless free labor society will tend to suss out and eliminate superfluous labor in the existing systems, that there is a lot of superfluous labor in the system that with that surplus time gifted back to the laborers, further surplus labor within the system will be identified and removed to some limit whereby the actual needs, wants and desires of the society are determined sans reference to the distorting effects of money upon the system and finally that such constitutes a good for the species. If you wanna get with my love, if you wanna get to know love. If you wanna get with my love, if you wanna got to show me love. Some aspects of the restoration of bioregions are not directly related to the moneyless free labor system. Some aspects are merely alluded to as plausible things that may indirectly result from the system in virtue of such magnanimous things as head nodding of agreement. However, a fair amount of the restoration of bioregions does come directly from the moneyless free labor system. Bioregional Constraints The constraint to the nominal limit of free trade within a bioregion entails not overusing the bioregion's resources. In a vain attempt to make money or supply the goods and services to other bioregions, that kind of systemization entails the non-overuse of any given bioregion. Hence enabling the bioregion to restore itself insofar as that is possible. At the same time, labor so constrained is incentivized to enable the bioregion's various life and non-life processes to do the work for them. Labor doesn't particularly want to do any work that it doesn't have to. In general terms, this amounts to an incentive to live within the rates of renewal of the various life and non-life processes of the bioregion. Such, of course, is not an overriding incentive. Labor also has incentives to utilize the land to produce enough materials and goods to live high-quality lives. To utilize technologies, techniques, extraction methods, etc., to draw forth more from the land than what is, oh, let's say, naturally available. The point, then, is that these incentives function on iteration to balance each other and coupled with the immediately preceding point, that there is no particular incentive to try and supply other bioregions with the goods and services available within any given bioregion, the tendency towards renewal of the bioregions is far greater. The utilization of the bioregion's resources as the primary go-to and the encapsulating of the labor system as being one in which labor is invested in the concerns of the local community. All provide the proper incentives and constraints for a bioregion to thrive while not overusing its resources, wherein overuse in the sense used in this section is becoming dependent upon a bioregion where you do not live and failing to work within the renewal rates of the relevant resources. Technophobia, redundancy of systems, the need to work to live. These kinds of things may not be super obvious and don't all relate directly to the moneyless free labor system. But these kinds of concerns do in point of fact inhibit the restoration of bioregions. Though it isn't always the case, insofar as technology enables people to work less while producing the same amount or more, these kinds of technologies overall reduce the consumption of the existing resources. This is due to a variety of factors that require some detailing. Going to work entails the use of resources. 
that is, in general, the transporting of the persons to and from work and whatever the labor is that the person is doing, generally uses some set of the resources within or without of the bioregion. Here we may note in the current the material costs associated with transport as being fairly significant. If technology enables us to reduce that, so much the better. In the relevant currents, this has a lot to do with telecommuting and labor that can be performed within the home more generally. This dovetails very well with the reality of the moneyless free labor society in that as people are working less outside the home, they are working more within the home and hence traveling less, requiring fewer jobs as, for instance, they cook for themselves rather than going out to eat, maintain their own homes rather than hiring someone to do so, educate and raise their own children rather than farming that out, and so forth. Email should have killed print industries, and it is largely on the path to do so. The point there is the dual technophobia and requirement to work to live force those industries to find some way to maintain themselves. For relevant points, the various delivery systems of adverts, papers, etc. are all essentially redundant, but because they offer good-paying jobs, which they do to be fair here, they fight to maintain themselves despite their own redundancy. Similar can be said for many industries that can be supplanted via the internets. In general, the internets utilize far less resources and requires far less labor to utilize than the industries they replace. It is not always the case, for instance, cryptocurrencies, rather infamously utilizes vast resources of energy to maintain far more than a basic paper money system. Of course, in a moneyless free labor system, all currencies are redundant. There are less obvious aspects of the internets by which they either can or do reduce the usage of resources. Specifically utilization of meeting spaces, be that for play or work, capacity to visit, otherwise very distant locales without physically going there may reduce the incentives for people to actually travel, the various development of online games supplanting the usages of materials to create physical objects of the same sort, etc. The technophobia associated with existing industries as a problem is generalizable, as the inability to adopt new technologies for fear of losing jobs that people are required to have in order to live. In the moneyless free labor system, such is simply not a concern and dovetails with the previous points regarding the weeding out superfluous labor and products. Fewer jobs entailing general reduction in usage of resources. The odd part therein are the risks associated with overproduction, better technologies and techniques entails the capacity to overproduce, overextract, etc. But again that issue is handled rather neatly via the hands of labor and bioregional constraints. As the subsection on the lazy fisherfolk illustrates, there is an ease for a moneyless free labor society to restore particular natural resources or bioregions, as a whole compared to the current systemization. Restoration is enabled to occur by ensuring that people are provided with all available goods and services as a matter of course, rather than via whatever their specific means of labor so happens to be. The stoppage of the production of some laborious task doesn't entail the death of the laborer, in other words, nor for that matter, the reduction of the goods and services those laborers have access to. Beyond the specific goods and services said laborers are being tasked with stopping, which are the exact same goods and services everyone else is being asked to forego. In the current such targeted actions are simply not plausible. Not only must there be some governmental or third-party 
Intervention to ensure that the laborers so tasked with the stoppage continue to get paid, but also the effects on other aspects of the economy can be rather profound, volatile, and destructive. In other words, the domino effects that occur within the current economic structure. Beyond the restoration of the resources and more broadly the bioregional structures, in the longer term moneyless free labor societies maintain themselves within the renewal rates of the resources they are utilizing simply, in virtue of the hands of labor and the bioregional restraints. Rather than reaching crisis points whereby the species has to make desperate choices, labor's incentives are exactly to maintain the resources at a maximally reproducing rate, as it means less labor for them overall. When this isn't occurring, rather than a full-on moratorium occurring as is likely the case these days with the fisheries and a host of other resource uses, slowdowns, moderation of use, and incentives to utilize other means, technologies, techniques, etc., all enable communities to avoid the catastrophic as a means of incentive to do something. It is a bit more subtle, but perhaps plausibly the case, and plausibly particularly pertinent. In the current the mentality of the economic towards dispositions of externalizing costs, the disposition towards hoping that someone else can do it, the disconnectedness between people and the processes whereby their goods and services are produced, all entail a problem for the utilization of resources and the degradation of the environment. It is perhaps worth recalling that even the notion that folks ought to care for the environment at all was something that had to be fought for. What folks may in the current take for granted as a duh kind of thing wasn't really a duh kind of thing until fairly recently in human history or at least only recently within the modern economic systemizations. The rationale that was commonly used was pretty much exactly something of the following form, look, I gots to eat, and that means I gots to make money. Wild space, natural spaces, these things are not going to feed me. Money feeds me. Which of course, and again, is actually quite literally crazy. It isn't just wrong or wrong-headed, it isn't just that it isn't understandable or relatable, though of course it has reality to it within the systemization of modern economies, it is quite literally crazy. It is of course wrong on a technical level, but then, that it is wrong that someone is wrong about something doesn't entail that they are crazy. It is crazy via vice. The vices therein are as alluded to before in the example of the destruction of the Amazon forest, but again, that example is just a particularly egregious example of what goes on all the time via the current economic systemizations. The rationale utilized destroys all means of production of goods and services as a means of justification for the production of goods and services. To reaffirm the relevance to this section, this kind of crazed, luntantic disposition is a resultant of the economic realities people are placed within in the current. To them, it makes sense, but then, the sense it makes is entirely a luntantic sense. Course, even the non-crazed within such a systemization also recognize the sense therein to the point. It is true that in the systemization folks do in point of fact need to do many of these fairly crazed sorts of things in order to live. Work to live, after all, is the reality. But that one has to do the things in order to live doesn't entail that the things one has to do are, hmm, sane. It is the folks who think with assuredness that in point of fact all these things that make luntantic sense are sane, those the crazed uncle fuckers. What this amounts to in the current are such things as casual mentalities of the destruction of ecosystems, extinctions of species, 
or various modalities of argumentation that attempt to justify such things in the name of the system as necessary sacrifices the species has to make to the dollar dollar bill yo. I want to try and be clear on the point. All arguments that tack themselves to such winds are tacking themselves into luntantic breezes. Such amounts to a kind of radical disconnectedness to the world, whereby the casual destruction of the very place where one lives is understood as a valid kind of disposition, an argument that ought to be taken seriously. Folks really ought to consider the plausibility, I'd say fairly undeniable fact, that folks making such arguments have completely lost their minds. They've accepted some actual crazed position as if it were fact, and all subsequent arguments, dispositions, etc., are all likewise crazed via the vice by which they've tacked themselves towards. The disposition leads to such things as casual littering, casual industrial scale pollution, casual clear cutting of whole forests, casual removal of mountain tops. Casual en mass destruction of whole species. Casual destruction of whole ecosystems. I think I've said it before, but it deserves to be said again and again if necessary. I've actually had to argue with people that the eradication of a species is a bad thing. The eradication of a people is a bad sort of thing. Folks really ought consider how crazed the folks I spoke to had to be in order for that to be a real argument to them. There aren't any, like, exactly zero, no good arguments to do these kinds of things. There never were, and there never will be. Only an actual insane person would think that there are. Folks that may say that there are, they may merely be confused, they may like a sane person in an asylum merely be following the luntantic sense that functionally works to keep them alive in such a place, and such people ought to come around via arguments such as these. But then, some people may not be sane, they may actually fully believe the lie, they may embody the lie, they may have tacked themselves to the luntantic breezes and think with assuredness that they going somewhere, anywhere at all. To quote the poet, there's not many people with a smile like this one, you think I'll win a prize, for these big eyes, and those dimples, on my cheeks. To be clear in clear skies, with good winds at our backs, moneyless free labor societies. Healthcare within a moneyless free labor society is rather straightforwardly provided. It is freely provided and freely available like everything else. Still, there are some points worth considering. Perhaps especially as many folks will think this merely a polar opposite to the current systemization. They may ponder such concerns as that between governmental structures and non-governmental structures. A moneyless free labor society isn't speaking of goods and services along that axis of concern, though. To quote the poets on the point, Polar opposites don't push away. It's the same on the weekends as the rest of the days. And I know I should go, but I will probably stay. And that's all you can do about some things. In terms of quality health care, in the current that which is rare is at least in part artificially rarefied via the metric of money, costs associated with the healthcare entail that some kinds of healthcare are unavailable. Be it consumers, providers, or the manufacturers involved, each have some kind of monetary cost concerns that entail a limit on the kind, availability, etc., of healthcare. A given expensive machine or expensive medicine or a time-intensive care, all are predicated upon primarily monetary constraints and not necessarily the labor associated with it. 
Little doubt that some of these kinds of healthcare goods and services require more or less labor to produce, more or less resources, etc. However, the amount of labor to produce them, again, is far less than ever. The industrialization entails far less labor involved. And yet all the laborers involved are getting rewarded less than they would within a moneyless free labor society. Consider the following fairly critical point. If the healthcare workers are working full time, the amount of labor involved is the same regardless. In other words, it doesn't really matter as a matter of costs in terms of labor to which sort of healthcare is being provided. Rather, there are fairly strange and arcane monetary concerns that make this or that healthcare practice more or less expensive. The people doing healthcare practice, a, uh, which takes the same amount of time or a comparable amount of time to healthcare practice, b, are not doing any sort of labor that is markedly different. We may try to hold that the various operati involved in a given healthcare practice entail more labor from other folks, and specialization of skill sets, etc., and this is true. However, absent the metric of moneyed concerns, we can note those things and yet still hold that they are essentially of equal valuation. In other words, each individual involved is still just doing some labor. The temptation to pretend that this or that type or aspect of labor is more or less valuable, and hence that it ought to be valued and rewarded, rarefied in this or that way is a serious issue in a moneyed society that just isn't present within a moneyless free labor society. An expensive machine is not expensive because of the components involved in its crafting, it is expensive, or not predicated upon the labor involved in its crafting. There is good reason for why this or that medical device may or may not ought be crafted, or that the number of them ought be determinable, however, such is not related to the amount of labors involved. Rather, it is a matter of meeting, in healthcare especially, the needs of people. While there may be some upper limit to that line of reasoning, as in, there may be some super-labor-intensive medical device that is just far too much labor involved to produce en masse, to meet the needs of it, we are likely therein speaking of something rather far-fetched and not something that is plausibly done within the current industrial medical processes. However, in terms not of medical devices, but rather constant care, specifically and generally elder care and care for those who need significant labor-intensive sorts of care, there are plausible upper limits of providing such kinds of care, especially via outside-the-home sort of care. That is, as professional care that kind of labor is very labor-intensive, and can encompass rather large portions of the population when we are speaking directly to elder care. In-home elder care is likely plausibly better for a wide variety of reasons, aside from the practical limits of professional elder care, but here we are speaking directly to the capacity of a moneyed system or a moneyless system to provide for those sorts of things. In the moneyless system, the notion is going to be rather directly that as folks are gifted back more time for in-home activities, they will thereby be able to provide a far greater quality and quantity of elder care via in-home practices. In terms of resources used, these issues are already covered as it relates to resource use in general. As it relates to healthcare in particular, we might surmise that such uses of resources would be a general priority or high priority. Meeting the needs, wants and desires of people as regards healthcare being a presumed good. We might expect that the increasing of resources within more local providers of healthcare would be a consequent of a moneyless free labor society, as the focus is after all to exactly provide for things as locally as possible. 
At the same time, much of the BS medicine currently in the market would likely tend to go away. As access to better healthcare becomes available, people will be less inclined to seek out alternative methods due to monetary costs, and lacking any monetary incentives the providers of such BS products have far less incentives to do so. For sure, there will remain some reason to have these, and some folks that prefer them. But the point is that such kinds of products lack any monetary incentives for either their production, distribution, or consumption, they will tend to rather dramatically decrease, especially over time. Such also dovetails with the principle and section regarding reduction of labor. In regards to unnecessary medical procedures, howsoever individuals may define them, there isn't any obvious reason as to why such wouldn't nonetheless be provided. Again, such frivolities are exactly the kinds of labor that we might expect folks to prefer within a moneyless free labor society. The distinction between necessary and unnecessary medical procedures remains somewhat blurred, caught up in the various BS that is currently within the system. However, as a general rule that sort of determination is likely best left between doctor and patient. An upshot within that is that all the various incentives for BS medical treatments are removed with the removal of money from the system, hence making far clearer the distinctions between these kinds of things. In pragmatics, Hospitals and providers like every other industry simply make requests for their needs regarding their practices, and they are provided by the relevant other industries. No fuss, no muss about it. We again might hold that such is considered a high priority, but the process of it all remains essentially the same as all other industries. In terms of staffing, there isn't much reason to suppose that there are not plenty of folks willing and able to do such things. In the current, monetary considerations more than anything else are stymieing such folks from learning the proper skills and practicing. That is, in many places it takes money in order to learn the skills, or rather, in order to get a degree that says you know the skills, and in the case of many of the jobs therein, the pay rate isn't particularly fantastic. Both of which present themselves as significant hurdles to folks who may want to enter those fields of labor for any number of reasons that have little or nothing to do with monetary concerns at all. They are, after all, classically, neoclassically, and currently considered noble sorts of professions. The benefits of laboring within them as an individual are significant, as in, it can make one feel good, like they are actually doing something meaningful, and indeed, on a societal level and on an individual level they are in fact doing good meaningful labor. The monetary concerns in the current are the concerns that are actively preventing people from working in these areas. Likewise. Monetary considerations, more than anything else in the current, are what stand in the way of practitioners from providing those kinds of services in various areas. All the monetary incentives are within the relatively large metro areas, and indeed, the monetary incentives are in all the wrong fields within medicine. Rather than having medical care being provided where there are needs, wants and desires, medical care is being provided where there is money for it, which may or may not correspond to the needs, wants and desires of people in general regarding medical care. As with all other aspects of moneyed societies, folks utilizing the tool of money to supposedly identify the needs, Wants and desires of people have come to take for granted that money in point of fact indicates those things, when of course it doesn't. At best, at most, again, it is just a tool, a really old tool, 
one that falters a great deal in its usefulness in determining such things. If it were understood as, oh, glasses to help the species see the rather ephemeral kinds of economic structures that exist, we may hold that they are quite primitive sorts of glasses to do so. The technology has improved, we can do better. The point as applicable to this section is that moneyed concerns have a tendency to override and distort medical concerns, interfere with the human processes by which folks would tend towards the medical profession in general, and provide a host of incentives to provide subpar, scam, and shitty health care to people. A moneyless free labor society simply avoids all of these distorting effects of moneyed concerns, and it is perhaps worth noting that it likewise avoids any distorting affects of fiat-style decision-making, as in, gov or corp x making decisions. I mean, I think the point is made without even getting into the issues of medical debt, healthcare insurance providers. GovX control and rationing of care, price of medicines, industry X's control and rationing of care, etc. Whole sections in this piece, whole books could and have been written on the horrors of these kinds of things. Here we are simplifying the problem, noting the viral cause of the problem, money, and prescribing a medicine to eradicate the virus. Among the industries most clearly whereby the moneyless free labor society shines, cleans up, improves upon, is exactly the medical industry. I suspect because the medical industry is of such obvious value that it's being fairly far raped by the monetary aims, as folks will tend to pay for it no matter what. As an exemplar of the horrors in a moneyed system, and the plausible goods of a moneyless system. I'd only caution folks to not single out the industry as if it were unique. Free health care for all, sure, but then, that same point is applicable across the board. Musical musing, I'm winning you with words, cause I have no other way. Crazy eyes have you? Are they gray or blue? I won't make the move. You must make the move. If you make the move, I will then approve. If you do not move, we will surely lose. More than the rhetorical point that absent money we technically remove poverty as such, for of course poverty is generally understood as a measure of money. The reality of poverty is an absence of the necessities of life, not money per se. Perhaps a bit more broadly put, poverty and wealth are measures of availability of the goods and services capable of being provided within a society, to provide for the needs, wants and desires thereof. Folks hoard money as if it were valuable, a kind of maximally crazed sort of thing to do, as if monies were the point. They think wealth is stacks of cash, when it's just stacks of tools, literally stacks of debts, but that is besides the point here. Just as folks might think that the removal of money entails the elimination of poverty, simply in virtue of eliminating the means of measurement of poverty, fat wallets don't make for fat stomachs. Luntantic dispositions that are hoarding actual tools, thinking they were useful and mass. Perhaps we may muse merely that folks fail to understand how the tool works, and so hoard them as if they were valuable in themselves. Like folks hoarding screwdrivers and not bothering to screw with them. The moneyless free labor society provides people with free access to all the existing goods and services available within a given bioregion. Hence, insofar as a bioregion is capable of providing for such things, everyone within them has access to them. Moreover, this isn't to say that there is a free-for-all either. Such kinds of dispositions fail to recognize the actual role the tool of money has played and the importance of actually organizing societies. 
freely chosen labor, utilization of the information the tool of monies has provided, utilization of the wisdoms the species has gained through its history, oft enough hard fought for, and so on. Hence, after all, the sheer length of this piece and indeed the volumes of material that folks have written on these kinds of topics. These aren't merely rhetorical points, it isn't merely definitionally true, though it is also definitionally true, it is a factual sort of practice that comes about through the implementation of moneyless free labor societies. It is perhaps important to note and in some cases restate some historical points. Housing and food generally were freely available throughout much of the species' history. That is to say, people generally worked the land for food and lived in homes upon the same land, which they did not, generally speaking, pay for. Oft enough they were taxed a portion of the goods they produced for sure, but as a general rule people ate what they produced, traded with their neighbors for foods they didn't, and generally made their own homes and goods either as a family or as a community. Now, I am not suggesting that we go back to that system. The point of highlighting it is to address the naysayers who may hold that a moneyless free labor society is untenable. Historically a version of this system was the reality. And in general people did not go hungry simply because they lacked money. Nor did they generally not have a home. Basics were broadly met, and so too, more than mere basics. People did go hungry because of such things as weather, poor crop harvests, etc. But such is a technical problem with technological solutions and solutions associated with trade and better bioregional management practices. It is not solvable via money. You cannot throw money at the weather to make the crops grow, making it rain, greenbacks is an impotent act. Many of the issues faced in the olden times simply are not nearly of as great significance in the current. We produce far more than enough food to feed everyone on the planet as it is, and we do so with far and away less labor. Moreover, as noted elsewhere, the variety of foods produced within any given bioregion is vastly superior, which aside from basic improvement in diets, entails the ability to protect any given bioregion from the harms of famine, and the various other tragedies that agriculture typically face. Moreover, within a moneyless free labor society, thanks in no small part to the capacity of interbioregional trade, in the event that any given bioregion does suffer from some catastrophic event that interrupts their capacity to meet the needs, wants and desires of the bioregion, all other bioregions are de facto capable of stepping in and providing for their needs, wants and desires as required. By the same token, with all the surplus of labor available through the metrics of the reduction of labor, the capacity for people to actually do that kind of good works labor is markedly increased. People already working 40-plus hours a week don't really have the time available to volunteer that kind of labor, and people who are forced to work to live lack proper motivation to do so. Why, such people may say, would I work for that person over there when I can barely manage to live based upon my labor as it is? One drawback of the historical models alluded to earlier regards specialized labor that is, labor that is not fairly directly dependent upon farming. In the current most labor, really the overwhelming amount of labor is specialized labor of one sort or another. The drawback in the historical modelings being that such specialized labor produced goods and services that we want, need and slash or desire, but the specialized laborer doesn't actually produce the basic needs of food for themselves. Even if their specialized labor was in fact the processing of foods, such as the brewing of beers, the baking of breads, 
and so forth. Hence, in no small part, the usefulness of monies within that system was to provide a means for the specialized labor to do their thing without starving to death. Within the moneyless free labor society in a meaningful sense what is being proposed is the removal of that aspect of the historical system whereby such specialized labor is effectively given away in much the same way as the labors of the farm were given away. Rather than mere concern regarding the basics, in other words, which were broadly met within the historical modelings, the proposal is that all such needs, wants, and desires can be broadly met, providing that certain constraints are followed, specifically bioregional constraints, and everyone more or less head nods their way to the overall understanding. How close we may be to such things. I said I wouldn't get caught up in the beginning. Now I'm feeling like I got caught up in the middle. We could just be friends soon as this comes to an end. Feeling like I got caught up. I said I wouldn't get caught up in the beginning. Now I'm feeling like I got caught up in the middle. We could just be friends soon as this comes to an end. Feeling like I got caught up. And? I'm pretty sure I love you has been said. On the question of housing, from the perspective of the builders. Whilst it is that housing needs, wants, or desires are had, in the current the laborers do the building of said housing. The owners or decision makers of construction companies or other entities that determine if, when, where, and how a given building project is to take place largely have as incentives either profit motivation or goodwill motivation. From the perspective of the owners of the construction company, their only incentive to say yes to a given project is if it makes them profit by doing so. Goodwill motivations to do so are largely held by charitable organizations and at least in theory, governmental organizations. From the perspective of the laborers, however, their only incentive to do so is to earn money in order to live. Of these sorts of perspectives, within a moneyless free labor society, motivation of the owners, decision makers, leaders, of a construction company are no longer about making a profit. The laborers are merely concerned with how much labor they are doing, and the decision-makers and leaders of a given construction organization are understood as laborers. The charitable and governmental organization's motives likely remain the same, though it is unclear to what extent they are really needed. Let's suppose the following, in all cases the aim is to provide high-quality housing for everyone. If the money defenders hold something otherwise, or indeed, if anyone holds something otherwise, we might consider such to be suspect regarding their motivation. In the moneyed society, the capacity to pay, in terms of money, is taken to be the determining factor as to if a given housing project can be done. Hence, from within their own hypothesis, the moneyed society is holding that they are simply meeting the relevant needs, wants, and desires, perhaps relative to the capacity of supply to do so, which they also hold as determined by money. From the perspective of free labor, the difference between doing this or that particular project doesn't really make much never mind to them. After all, Generally speaking, labor is labor. Hence, on any given housing project, labor, inclusive to the various decision makers and leaders thereof, doesn't particularly care, provided that they aren't being required to do more labor. Wherein such is understood to be more about developing higher quality, longer lasting, building projects that meet the relevant needs, wants, and desires of the relevant folks, rather than any particular sense of amount of housing built. See also sections 12a and 12b on minor mansions 
and more generally minor luxury goods, as there is a motivation for labor to build high quality, even luxury, as a matter of course. The rationale therein being artistic, as well as selfish, high quality means durability, means less work, and beautiful entails joyfulness in the labor, longevity in the consumer's enjoyment of it, and some extent of peacocking it. We may therefore ponder at the following. Does it make any difference whatsoever from the laborer's perspective if they are building a housing project because the metrics of money are being utilized to determine such things, or because the metrics of simply directly meeting the relevant needs, wants, and desires of the relevant people are utilized? In terms of compensation, again, the laborers, and generally speaking everyone, gets far more within the moneyless free labor society than they do within the moneyed society. So compensation isn't a real concern. The only relevant questions regard motivations, determinations of the relevant needs, wants and desires, and basics of supply staying within the relevant renewal rates. As it concerns existing housing, there are no obvious reasons why all absentee landlord housing ought not simply transfer to those who are currently living there. Where absentee landlord housing means housing that is not also being lived in by the landlord. However, there are some unobvious reasons, and hence it is worth exploring the housing situation in some depth. 1. Single-family homes wherein the landlord is not also living there, and hence presumably is choosing to live somewhere else, could simply pass the home on to the family that is actually living there. There is no harm involved to the landlord, after all, they like everyone else also are gaining free access to all the goods and services within the society. In terms of mortgages, these simply go away out of hypothesis. Monetary debt as a concept not really being present within a moneyless free labor society. 2. Apartment complexes rather straightforwardly have the individual units transfer to those living within them. Again, the landlords of such places lose nothing in the process save perhaps some sense of personal responsibility regarding their upkeep. While that upkeep is important, and who in particular is responsible for it is a valid question, I will merely point out at least these two kinds of generic, plausible responses to it. To A. Those living there have primary responsibility for doing so just as is the case with any home ownership in the current. To be. Like everyone else, they may utilize the services of others, electricians, plumbers, etc., the kinds of essential services that are required for upkeep. There may be housing envy, as in, who gets to live in the better housing. In pragmatics this is answerable really only through longer-term iteration of the moneyless free labor society. As with all other homeowners, they are incentivized to improve their own homes, have access to the relevant materials to do so, and granted the time to do so. Apartment complexes are a bit more complex than single-family homes, in that when it comes to the pragmatics of the labor involved they are far more inherently cooperative affairs. Labor strictly internal to a given unit is fairly well easily delineated, as the primary responsibility of the persons living within that unit. But when it comes to aspects that are not so well localizable, some understanding of cooperative responsibility is required. These kinds of cooperative responsibility agreements are not particularly difficult to grasp. The exact aspects of it may vary, but the point is that it isn't really a difficult, let alone insurmountable problem. Some kinds of housing are a bit more odd, and their oddity may very well suggest that they would tend to be less common in a moneyless free labor society. 3. 
College housing. College housing is specifically intended as a fairly unique kind of temporary housing arrangement, whereby those living there are not really intended to be doing so indefinitely. Such housing has real value, at least insofar as we are to continue valuing colleges and universities, or indeed, any similar sort of temporary living slash housing arrangements. For instance, to house and host travelers to a heretofore distant land may require similar kinds of arrangements. There is little reason to suspect that such housing would continue to be maintained by private landlords. They have no incentive to do so. The most obvious and plausible suggestion is that such housing ought to come under the jurisdiction of the college and university. That said, there is the plausibility that some folk may prefer to take on the role of private landlord of such places. Which is to say, that such does constitute relevant labor within the moneyless free labor society. Maintaining, improving, etc., such housing is important. Regardless, students clearly lack the skills and motivation to do so themselves, and as a matter of pragmatic of studies, having them take on that responsibility is likely counterproductive as it would too greatly interfere with their studies. While there is an argument to be made that by having the students take on some of those responsibilities, as being important towards their future responsibilities, such is likely at least somewhat overblown within the moneyless free labor society, as such learning likely already would have taken place as they grew up, as their families would have already been primarily responsible for such things. Secondarily, such housing may be relegated to local governing bodies. Such has a relevant point regarding zoning laws which, as discussed elsewhere in this piece, very likely do come within the jurisdiction of local governing bodies. Though that may amount to gov concerns for zoning and university, college, and or private landlord being responsible for maintenance, upkeep, building, etc. 4. Hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, and other temporary housing. Understand such housing as providing a service in the most obvious of sense, it enables folks to visit different locations. Such constitutes relevant labor. Ownership of such places is somewhat irrelevant, the folks that do the labor, including the decision makers and leaders of the organization, are the ones that effectively own the place. In the specific case of bed and breakfast locations, including Airbnbs, wherein the persons running the place actually live there, we may very well hold that they effectively own the place as with any other homeowner. In places wherein the place is run by people who do not live there, we may hold that such is viewed in the same way as any other absentee landlord. The odd caveat therein being that as temporary housing, such may not necessarily transfer to anyone in particular. The question of what to do with those kinds of housing is a bit odd. They may be treated as hotels, motels, etc., whereby they are considered legitimate labor, or they may be transferred to vacant housing, perhaps merely depending on the choice of those who currently are running the place. It also may be the case that the current landlords are intending on moving back into such housing, that its status as a bed and breakfast is intended as a temporary one. In which case it would be odd, perhaps even unfair, to pull that out from under them. Moreover, it may be undesirable to have it be the case that folks do not do such practices. It is likely desirable to enable people to provide that kind of temporary housing arrangement. 5. Multiple home ownership in the current. There isn't any obvious reason why folks cannot own more than one home, doing so doesn't necessarily affect any local housing. 
to be clear there, even in the current, having a house in a locale that is largely empty most of the year doesn't actually entail that there are not enough houses slash living spaces within that locale. In the current, such is an issue because folks are concerned about housing prices, affordable housing, etc. Not necessarily because there isn't actually enough housing as such. For sure, in some particularly, shall we say, overcrowded places like large and mega cities, there is some degree whereby a house or unit sitting empty or unused is a real issue. Note, however, that the expectation within a moneyless free labor society is that populations will tend to move away from large and mega cities, as the impetus to live there in order to earn more money is necessarily no longer relevant. In the current second homes make up a small fraction of homes, so such isn't a particularly pressing issue regardless, at least in the current. The question regarding ownership of second homes may be more pressing within a moneyless free labor society. What, after all, prevents folks from claiming and hence owning multiple homes? At least in theory this presents something of an issue, however, it is seriously unclear as to how significant an issue it will be in practice. The hands of labor may rather simply deal with this by refusing that kind of labor in general, which doesn't exactly bar second home ownership, but may seriously curtail it. For instance, it may very well be the case that it is desirable within a locale for folks to own a home there at least part-time, perhaps in terms of increasing the local population, which potentially brings in additional labor, skills, etc. In the current as populations are decreasing, we ought expect there to be a corresponding increase in the number of available housing, and indeed, in the current there are already around 10% of homes that are vacant. Having someone invested enough in the homes to restore, improve, etc., those homes may be another reason for a locale to prefer someone having a second home there. In the current we can see, for instance, places that are selling houses for virtually no money in order to attract people to them. The rationals as to why people don't go to these places having a lot more to do with the pragmatics of money than anything else, specifically, can't have a good paying job there. Those kinds of rationales go away in a moneyless free labor society. 6. Prioritizing housing. Prioritizing housing for the poor is likely the best methodology. Note that as poverty disproportionately affects various minority groups, by prioritizing the poor de facto folks will also be prioritizing the various minority groups, insofar as a minority group is actually disproportionately poor. Insofar as they are not, there isn't any obvious or as far as I can tell an obvious reason why they ought to be prioritized. What that may actually entail in the long run are such things as significant improvements to existing housing, noting that in many pragmatic ways this is not something that has to be mandated or determined from on high. If the existing poor become homeowners and gain access to the necessary materials and time available to do the labor, there is little reason to suspect that they wouldn't thereby make the improvements themselves. In other words, someone's living in a relatively fine bit of housing isn't likely to have a lot of motivation to improve it. It is, after all, labor to do so. Whereas someone living in relatively poor housing does have a lot of motivation to improve it. Houses that are on the existing market for sale or rent likewise we might expect to get snapped up by folks in more need of better housing. After all, there isn't a whole lot to be gained by doing so for folks already living in a relatively fine home. Recalling that moving involves a lot of effort and generally is undesirable by most people, 
as it entails moving away from friends, family, community, etc. Setting aside for the moment the various issues that cause homelessness beyond the mirrorness of poverty, there remain some issues regarding relative inequality in homes. Implicit as a consequent of the moneyless free labor system is a redistribution of the population away from large cities and megacities. In part this is a natural development of the hands of labor. In part this is a consequent of the bioregional constraints the system is predicated upon. In part this is also an ethical imperative. It is about making the ethical choice in the matter for the long-term and overall benefit of people. The latter, that is the ethical imperative aspect, is the why as to why this is listed in the real benefits section. Housing, hands of labor. Bluntly, people generally prefer to not have to commute to work. Given the option, most laborers would far rather spend their time closer to their workplace than not. In the current, wherein jobs, perhaps largely superfluous labor, is concentrated within large and mega cities, we see the basically inevitable outcome of a system wherein people work to live. People congregate as close to these places as possible. But of course these kinds of cities can't possibly house all these people, so people commute a lot. Housing, Bioregional Constraints Within any given bioregion the constraints on a bioregion have micro-components to them. Without forcing the issue, as a matter of course the imperative is to shorten the supply lines in all the systems, within a limit of centralized and mass production. That limit is a fairly obtuse question tbh, especially from on high in theory. In practice, however, it is far less obtuse. The bioregional constraints determine this limit rather directly by primarily focusing on the needs, wants, and desires within a given bioregion, the centralization of industrial processes is thereby delimited. On the other end of things, goods and services that meet the needs, wants and desires of the intra-bioregional structures have their own technical limit. Those kinds of goods and services that are either necessarily not available within any given bioregion, see unequal distribution of the raw materials as it relates to intra-bioregional trade, or which are better produced and distributed via a centralized network via the metrics of shortened supply lines, and maintaining within the renewal rate of resources. At the base level, that is, in terms of meeting the basic needs of foods and shelter, realistically this entails the local bioregion supplying as much of the local needs, wants, and desires as is possible. In other words, prioritizing, but not limiting, the food and shelter production of a given bioregion to those closest to the source of food production. In general this provides an incentive to move away from large and mega cities, as in general this will mean that the food and shelter supply is geared towards providing for the locales closest to them. Such will only go so far, but as the system is iteratively actualized, there will be such a tendency. Much of the reduction in labor is going to occur within large and mega cities, as by and large these kinds of locations are utterly dependent upon the long-distance trade of goods, in particular of foods and shelter. As the relevant labor that is done within these places diminishes, the economic imperative inherent in the current system to live where the money is will go away. Indeed, that going away of the moneyed system will be a rather immediate and dramatic sort of thing, even within the first pass-through of the moneyless free labor system. But a bit more subtle, the economic notion of taking advantage of economies of scale largely though not completely goes away wherein economies of scale at its core actually refers to large-scale centers of populations. 
In short, wherein making money is the primary concern, it is easier to make money within larger centers of people. After all, it is people that matter, people that do the buying, etc. Secondarily, economies of scale refer to exactly the kinds of interbioregional trade that is to be delimited as such. Hence, labor associated with such things will tend to go away. Absent this motivating factor, the economic incentives to even have these kinds of large and mega cities goes away. Personal motivation of choice in living location. It isn't as if people in general adore living in these large and mega cities. Lacking any particular motivation to be within them as a matter of work to live mentality, people in general will want to live in more beautiful places. Aside from the various more subtle incentive style motivations, people in general do tend to enjoy living in communities that are broadly accessible to the wilder spaces. Travel incentives, visiting incentives, variety of life incentives. These all largely relate to the realities of a world wherein people are living within the constraints of the limits of renewal of resources. People value the wilder spaces, people want to be able to experience them as such. Of this, there is little doubt, the tourism industry fairly well displays this point. Beyond the ethical imperative to do so, beyond indeed the pragmatic imperative to do so, there is the naked reality that travel utilizes exactly those kinds of resources we are primarily concerned with as regards overuse of the resources, that is, use of resources beyond their renewal rate. Hence, living closer to exactly those kinds of destinations people want to go to visit becomes a rather pragmatic choice. It is very likely the case that at least mega cities, and likely any city beyond some, admittedly unknown, size is simply not sustainable. They obviously destroy the environment, create massive pollution, and are almost definitionally not actually sustainable in the sense that their existence is especially dependent upon interbioregional trade. Indeed, at the first pass through, given the constraints of the system towards a bioregion being maximally self sustaining, the limits of the resources within the bioregion entails a limiting factor for the size of cities dependent upon primarily, for their existence exactly the resources within that bioregion. Understanding that intrabioregional trade is basically freeform. Each bioregion utilizes the resources it has to maximally provide for their own needs, wants, and desires. It is the interbioregional trade which is of secondary consideration that provides the means for cities larger than the intrabioregional trade allows to exist. This principle again is foundational to the system and indeed is foundational to the ecologies upon which all the species systems are predicated and dependent upon. Beyond that kind of basic understanding, there are sound reasons to avoid, though not eliminate, interbioregional trade. They distort the fundamental systems upon which they are dependent, creating inherent inequities in the living conditions within differing bioregions. And they distort the renewal rates of the bioregions upon which the species is dependent. This is very likely an unavoidable consequent of the current system, wherein extraction of other bioregional resources are at the whims of some other bioregion. Hence, the creation of mass scale inequalities from a global perspective, and indeed, at every single scalar of the current system. By whims, I mean rather specifically supposed wealth and power see the absurdities in the interbioregional trade system. Moreover, interbioregional trade creates systems of dependency, notably the large and mega cities, but also between any given bioregion, 
wherein the bioregion is dependent upon aspects of the economics that have little or nothing whatsoever to do with it. This kind of concern is one that is important and rather dramatically displayed via the pandemic, hence the imperative to shorten supply lines. More though than the mirrorness of the fragility of overextended supply lines, the issues relate rather well to issues wherein food is shipped around the world for wealth, as are various building materials, wherein these are actually readily available within any given bioregion, or capable of being produced within any given bioregion. Restoration of bioregions requires labor. In every pragmatic sense anyone ought to be concerned with, the labor that is required in the short term is restoration of the bioregions in general. Such labor entails the movement of peoples towards exactly those bioregions that require such labor. The details of this aspect inherently are dependent upon the bioregion in question, but as a matter of course the issues within non-large slash megacities are generally the same. The main point in this subsection is that these aspects of bioregional constraints, inter-slash-intrabioregional trade all entail certain pragmatic outcomes regarding housing in general that are brought about by the personal choices of people living within such a systemization. These are not, in other words, Dictums that are determined via some persons other than the individuals and familial units who make the decisions of where to live, how to live, etc., within a systemization that doesn't utilize money as a motivational whip, and whereby there are restraints placed upon trade predicated upon bioregions, remaining within the renewal rates of the resources and motivations towards preferencing quality housing and living arrangements. Existing inequities in basic housing. This deserves some degree of definition in terms of the meaning of inequities and basic housing. Specifically bioregions will differ predicated upon the available resources within them. Basic building materials as a general rule ought to be derived from the bioregion within which the homes are built. Moreover, cultural differences may vary the specifics of housing arrangements. These kinds of differences ought not be understood as inequities. The presumption that, for instance, all houses ought to be built of wood or steel or concrete, etc., simply in virtue of some supposed metric of supposed quality, and hence the derived notion of equality and inequality of housing arrangement are all invalid. Not really merely suspect, but flatly invalid. They are invalid in that they presume some other cultural arrangement of housing as being superior. They are invalid as they inherently make homes within a bioregion dependent upon other bioregions, and hence ultimately unsustainable as a rule, though again see section 11 interbioregional trade and all discussions in this piece on the topic as this rule is not absolute, and they are invalid as a matter of modality of life, as in any sense of equality and inequality therein will tend to have the rather devastating effect of uniformity in living. Within that understanding we ought also well note that in the relevant current, wherein culture is a notion that is largely attached to nationality rather than bioregion, and likewise culture is in part a derivative of interbioregional trade, the current is rather fucked. People within any given bioregion have a tendency to look upon other bioregions, especially more wealthy bioregions and hold something of the notion that equality entails living in that manner over there. Which isn't to suggest that there is no inequality between these bioregions, there is. See the horrors of interbioregional trade, extractive methodologies, etc for a basic understanding as to what those horrors amount to.
and it is likely worth repeating the note that the delimiting of interbioregional trade and the giving of primacy to intrabioregional trade are the proposed and I dare say likely best sort of solutions to this particular set of problems. See also the relevance of the aesthetical ethical as praise slash blameworthy and the ethically obligatory in the odd questions of privilege, a slight history of colonialism. The somewhat more pragmatic concerns I want to address touch upon existing inequities within any given bioregion as such. These are typically, and not entirely wrongly, associated with issues of racism, and various versions of the horrors of capitalism, systemic poverty, etc. But the point is largely this, within any given bioregion how do we deal with the fact that some people live in high-quality homes, and others live in very low-quality homes? In the longer term this issue is addressed rather directly and has been noted already, gifting people back their labor enables the people themselves to have the time available to improve their own living conditions, while granting them free access to the various relevant goods and services of a given bioregion, and all its adjacent bioregions gifts them the means to do so. The limit therein being the bioregional capacities of renewal and the restraints of the hands of labor, rather than any sense of monetary capitalization. At least, such is the case within the moneyless free labor system. Again, with the first pass-through of the system the work-week hours remains largely the same, there are job losses associated with the shift, things that just fall out of the change in system, but wherein those kinds of job losses do not occur, the labor remains the same. For the relevant laborers, recall, there is no meaningful shift, they are not being expected to work harder, the projects they work on and the locations they work may change, but in raw terms of hours worked there is no difference. In terms of compensation, for the overwhelming majority of people there is either no real change or improvement, whereas for the poor there is improvement in their access to various goods and services. For anyone who is not particularly poor, the main change initially is simply the erasure of all debt. That in and of itself may entail some shift in their consuming habits, but then, if they aren't already poor, those kinds of habits are already likely over-consuming. Hence, it isn't as if these people have much incentive to consume more goods and services than they already are. Folks can only cram so much into their pie holes, so to speak. Such may or may not entail waiting lists for work to be done. Much of that really depends on how much surplus labor is currently in the market. In any case, a waiting list is preferable to the labor simply not being done, and it is the case that in the current waiting lists are a thing as it is for pretty much everything at this point. So, if there isn't a real meaningful difference, such is hardly a real criticism. It is plausible that as the surplus labor is removed, it can be reallocated towards these kinds of projects, though the plausibility of such relatively instantaneous changes will vary considerably from bioregion to bioregion, and indeed from locale to locale. See however priority labor as noted earlier, people really do respond to adverts, needs, etc., if they have the time available to them to do so. Successive pass-throughs of the systemization will tend towards such reallocations of labors, that is, the directing of people's attentions towards the bioregional and locales' needs, wants, and desires. Handling the inequities in homes being one of the primary concerns of most folks, as it is particularly practical and effective on their lives, such improvements have a strong ethical and emotive imperative attached to them. As a final note on the point of existing inequalities, in general people are not interested in mansions, 
good homes sure, mansions, eh. We are not speaking, that is, towards some wild fantasy land of mansions everywhere, but rather towards homes, many of which may already exist, that can be improved through on the one hand, gifting people back their labor and providing the resources to do so themselves, and on the other hand, the plausible use of the existing construction labor being redirected towards those ends. The problem of housing being out of place. There is a somewhat serious problem wherein most people live in these large and mega cities. By that I mean, the homes there are already existing, some people are not particularly likely to move or want to move, and the areas they are living in are not sustainable either in the system being proposed here or the current system or indeed very plausibly within any realistic system that is attempting to be sustainable for anything like the long haul. The problem runs somewhat deeply. One aspect critically worth noting, there is not a problem of availability of land. In theory these people could distribute themselves away from the centralized people farms to the huge swaths of land available elsewhere and as this system is suggesting, thereby in large part deal with many, perhaps most of the current ills and serious issues the species faces. Suppose that we incentivize people to move, they do so for various reasons. On the one hand we have masses of former housing that sits empty. This gigantic mess in essence that either gets abandoned for in nature to do its thing, or which requires us to demolish it and clean it up ourselves. On the other hand, we have a massive building projects before us, whereby in essence all that housing has to be provided elsewhere. The pragmatics of doing so are daunting to say the least. In terms of resource use, it is extremely wasteful. In terms of labor it may very well be viewed as the kind of thing we wouldn't want to do doesn't matter exactly the time frame that this happens either. If this were to occur through some huge push that makes it take, say, a decade, not particularly unreasonable a time frame given the species' capacity to do so quickly, albeit that is like massive government intervention or massive agreement of people, etc., to do something like that, or if it takes several generations to do so, as people slowly depopulate large and mega cities and repopulate the more rural areas in small cities, towns, etc. Aside from the ginormous buildings in the cities proper, the skyscrapers, etc., we also would have to deal with the plausible movement of industrial centers, and perhaps even more disturbingly on all levels, the relocation of the suburbs, these huge swaths of housing that are fairly well dependent upon the large and mega cities. It is a chain of dependency that is unsustainable though. That fact cannot be ignored, for all the obvious hardships involved with such a thing, neither in theory nor in practice are those kinds of places sustainable. This fact is important to recognize and accept, because the alternative of doing nothing is eventual catastrophes. Be that through massive wars over resources as they grow scarce, famines as resources grow scarce, the ravages of infectious diseases due to the dependency on the interbioregional trade of these places, uprisings from the massive inequities the current system has within it, or some other such thing. The choice, in other words, put in the most stark terms, is something like, we can deal with this beforehand, avoid all the catastrophes and so forth, or we can deal with it in the aftermath, post-apocalyptic world. Aside from dealing with the catastrophes as such, which would be pretty horrific, the pragmatics will also be more difficult then. In other words, the question really is something like, do we deal with this beforehand or after? 
More positively put, do folks want to work towards something good and wonderful or something horrifically atrocious? I want to give a few bits of guidance as to how this plausibly can function before the various catastrophes and address some of the obvious naysayers' probable points. Suburbs In a sense these places are small towns and cities in waiting. The main issue therein is that they are broadly importing their food supplies. In essence, some percentage of these places ought to be transformed into farmland, which does entail the removal of existing buildings. The exact metrics of this are determinable. We do have the capacity to determine the basic acreage to provide food for a given population, relative to the various foodstuffs being grown therein. The most difficult aspect of this is the raising of animals, which can be pretty land-intensive, or else horrific industrial practices, and regardless will tend to produce concentrated pollution within the area. It may be possible depending on the exact location, but in general the growing of crops is likely the better alternative, especially in the short term. In the longer term it wouldn't be surprising if the reduction of the population in large and mega cities lends itself well to the capacity of the existing suburbs to repurpose enough lands for the raising of animals. This is in essence a restoration of the local lands there. Aside from the obvious labor associated with the farming of the lands, all the food grown therein provides for other food-related industries, restaurants, food processings, etc., with the aim being to provide for the local populace within that particular suburb slash area. I say area, as it is unclear simply as a matter of theory as to exactly how great an area can be supplied in this fashion, especially in any given location. Again, those kinds of metrics are determinable, we have the skills, we can do better winky face. Moving of houses It is unclear regarding the metrics and pragmatics of this, but it is possible to just move houses from one location to another. This has the benefit of not having to utilize new resources, not having to waste the resources of the existing house, and carries with it a certain kind of style and culture that might otherwise be lost in some preserving the house. Incentives of well-being As well noted in this piece, absent the metric of money the incentive to not live within the large and mega cities is likely pretty great. Given the option, let's say, between living in a cramped studio or living in a three-bedroom house, most people are going to opt for the latter. The point there being rather bluntly that the basic incentives to have a good home are going to go a long way towards achieving this. Daunting Scalers It's too large scale a project. This is clearly false. There are plenty of historical examples of the species taking on rather grand projects partially when faced with impending or actualized catastrophes, or when presented with good options towards a more promising future. Moreover, the species' productive capacity is far greater than it ever has been, and the relevant labor involved can be significantly decentralized. Unprecedented Although clearly false to anyone with anything like any sense at all of history, Sadly, nonetheless, this is likely a naysayer's sort of concern. Folks ought to grasp at the fact that historically people have been moving en masse to the cities rather specifically via the applicable force the whip of money has placed upon them. These folks did not go willingly, they lamented the fact that they had to leave their communities, their families, their friends, etc., these things were done en masse, over a few generations. This says nothing whatsoever to the points regarding more directly forced relocations that have occurred throughout history, 
nor for that matter many of the somewhat more freely chosen relocations. Historically and in the current there have been and are plenty of instances whereby land, houses, homes, etc., are quite literally given away to encourage people to move there. In still living memory are the efforts made during World War II whereby whole civilizations around most of the world were mobilized towards rather specific ends to deal with the impending disasters the World War was bringing upon them. Nor again are such mobilizations unique to that particular war, nor limited to wars in general. None of these kinds of things are in any way, shape, or form unprecedented, and perhaps all that is lacking is a sense of towards what shall the species aim itself to the doing? But then, here we are, are we not? Regards to ending hunger. Ending hunger can be understood as entailing the proper production and distribution of foodstuffs. Here we shall present this is three aspects, the reduction of monocropping, the growing of native plants and the raising of native animals, and the elimination of food waste. Reduction of monocropping While there is certainly an important role for monocropping, as we tend to monocrop those foods that are most productive and hence feed the most people, the extent of the monocropping wherein it is utilized to primarily feed people outside the bioregion it is grown is wildly inefficient. Regeared towards primarily producing for peoples within a given bioregion, we still would monocrop to some meaningful extent. However, as few are those who really want to eat just a small selection of food, and given the current capacity to grow a wide variety of foods very productively within most bioregions, the general mode of farming the lands will tend towards a wide variety of crops, though likely with a preference towards certain highly productive crops. Bluntly, there are no monetary incentives involved to produce cash crops and hence, while there are incentives to produce highly productive crops, those incentives to do so are not distorted by the metrics of money. This alone will go a long way towards restoration of the bioregional habitat, though it is worth noting that most of such crops are not actually from the bioregion they are grown. Nonetheless, the various animals and insects are better adaptable to a variety of crops rather than just monocrops, and there are indeed a great deal of other benefits associated with doing so, already well noted within the relevant lit. In terms of monocrops in the current system, it is odd to say the least, indeed it is wildly inefficient in total, to have various bioregions grow primarily one crop or a small selection of crops, trading those crops to far distant bioregions, in order to get crops that are likewise monocropped in those far distant bioregions. These are aspects of the insanities produced via the monetary-based trading system in the current. Now some of that is perhaps worthwhile, but such ought be the exceptions not the rule. Again, when the system is geared towards bioregional self-sufficiency, wherein most bioregions already have the capacity to grow a wide variety of crops, this antiquated notion of trading for goods and services unavailable locally as the primary means of providing for those goods and services simply goes away. The reduction of monocropping thereby provides for the sustainability of food production within each bioregion. Hence, towards the elimination of hunger, the growing of native plants and the raising of native animals. While there are certainly goods to be had with variety, that variety only exists via the native plants and animals of each bioregion. There is a great deal of pragmatics involved in ensuring that the native plants and animals within a bioregion are thriving after all. As noted elsewhere, labor in general prefers it when the various plants and animals do the work for them, as should any sane human. 
perhaps nowhere is this more pertinent than in the oceans, as mentioned rather directly earlier. But another relevant aspect regards the existing species within a given locale more generally. In other words, bison, deer, etc., letting these kinds of animals do the labor of reproducing themselves, themselves, enables people to benefit from them in raw terms of food as well as in the more obtuse terms of maintaining broader ecological structures. Such isn't really to suggest that there isn't value in farm animals. Such indeed holds a somewhat dubious proposition ethically speaking depending on how people feel about the treatment of animals. Specifically, industrial farming, factory farms, etc. In terms of raw land usage it is likely the case that these kinds of farming techniques use less resources and land than their wild counterparts. Comparing the usage to the growing of plants is different, and perhaps not entirely relevant. My strong suspicion is that bioregional constraints largely though not completely deal with this issue. In other words, factory farming and industrial farming is primarily geared towards feeding people not within a given bioregion. I don't particularly oppose the notion of bioregional centralized meat processing or more generally food processing, such may in fact be very good regarding resource management overall and reduce the labor involved rather dramatically. It's when that processing is geared towards the feeding of peoples beyond a given bioregion that the processing, housing, and technical details become far more seriously ethically and pragmatically dubious. The environmental damage involved within the bioregion becomes overwhelmingly terrible, and the basic ethical treatment of animals becomes seriously compromised. As with plants, the raising of animals to primarily feed a given bioregion entails a variety of animals being raised within that bioregion, rather than the monofarming of any one given animal. Beyond farming, the variation of the native animals provides for a kind of resource that differentiates between the various bioregions. Elimination of Food Waste The immediately preceding two subsections provide for the relevant food production methodologies and points towards the elimination of hunger. In regards to the distribution of foods there are a few points worth considering. Helping Hands By each bioregion being maximally self-sustaining in terms of food production, the species thereby enables for the dealing with instances of famine, natural variations in crop production, weather, etc., whereby each bioregion is capable of thereby supplying other bioregions at such times. Food Storage the species' capacity to store foodstuffs has fairly radically increased. Beyond even the somewhat obvious methodologies of, for instance, dried, canned and frozen foods, there are a host of processed foods whereby the food material is capable of lasting for extended periods of time. In some, increased shelf life of foods entails a rather massive increase in capacity to store foods and eliminate food waste. Food given away. As with everything else in a moneyless free labor society, food is of course simply given away. This rather neatly and succinctly deals with the other serious problem regarding food waste, failing to feed people because they got no cash monies. This actually has several key aspects to it worth folks considering, though here I shall only briefly note them. In the current whereby foods cost the cash, foodstuffs have a glut in regions that are cash-rich. This entails not only wasted food, but also fairly massive amounts of wasted labor, and plausibly also poor utilization of land. The inefficiencies in the systemization are quite profound, and importantly the issues are stemming rather directly from the distortions in the systemization of foods, stuffs, labor, etc., 
via money. Land that is used to farm and or raise animals is used to move food to people who literally don't use it, it is quite literally thrown away. Not only does this entail the waste of food, the hunger of people, it also entails the useless destruction of land and the useless performance of labor. Without delving too deeply into the mechanics of it here, though of course this whole piece does exactly delve deeply into the mechanics of it all, the same or less amount of labor can be used to redirect that food towards folks that are in need of it. Moreover, when the food is given away, there are no perverse incentives whereby food is literally thrown away rather than given away as a means of ensuring that folks continue to pay all the cash monies for the foodstuffs. Such entails a far more efficient systemization, in other words. Where efficiencies are not measured via the mistaking of the tool of measurement for the thing being measured. In other words, efficiencies in the current are understood as being relative to all the cash monies, not of the things the dollar-dollar bill yo is supposed to be measuring. One can have a remarkably efficient system of monies that is entirely distorted and disconnected from the food systems it is supposed to be measuring and regulating. Which of course is exactly what we have in the current. Utterly inefficient markets that have all the appearance of efficiencies to them via the moneyed concern, but none of the substance of efficiencies anyone would actually want. If folks are simply taking what they need, want, and desire of the foodstuffs, such entails an accurate measure of the needs, wants, and desires of people. Utilizing that metric directly, rather than via the distorting effects of money as a tool of measurement, already entails greater efficiencies of the proper sort and concern. When coupled with the maximally self-sustaining structure of each bioregion, such entails the sound production and distribution of foodstuffs. Aiko ilelo ai.